Well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, my hometown. Out on the edge of the prairie and spring, spring out there, which in the case of Minnesota means there's a little more snow forecast. Uh, about eight inches of snow, some places 10 inches fell. On Monday and Tuesday, people looked out at the great silence of snow in April, and they had to decide whether to shovel or not. They looked around at their neighbors' houses. Nobody was shoveling. They opened their doors. They listened hard on Monday night. There was no sound of shovel scraping on concrete. And so against their own deep instincts to take care of snow and shovel it, they did not shovel. And by not shoveling, they allowed the snow to melt of its own accord, and it now mostly has melted. There is some green grass. Sometimes by not doing something, we accomplish something. This goes against everything that I was brought up to believe from the time I was just a small, small child. The mud season is now upon us, and the farmers are getting ready to plant. They sit in the big booth in the corner of the Chatterbox Cafe and they shake the dice to see who's going to pay for coffee. Not that it's a big thing because they had a very good year this last year. Not that they would ever mention it or ever talk about it. It would be bad luck to them. And they expect to have just as good a year this year as last. But success sits uneasily on a farmer. Farmers don't abide by a philosophy of, of success. They believe that success means simply to postpone chaos and disaster. <laughs> this is the best that we can hope for. All lives end with the same conclusion, and we just postpone it as long as possible. The posse is on your trail, and they're getting closer and closer. And if you give them the slip this year, that gives you a little more time, but they are going to catch up with you eventually. And they are going to put a rope around your neck and they're going to hang you because, <laughs> because you deserve it. This is, uh, <laughs> this is the philosophy that I, that I grew up uh, with, the inevitability of, of failure. You can hide it from other people as best you can and you can f feign a sort of competence, but God knows the difference, so you may as well be aware of it as well. You young people, you grew up with a whole different idea. See, you believe in liberation. You believe in self-expression and creativity. And, uh, and you believe in progress. You believe in, 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 in making gains and, and, and moving forward. And if you admitted it, you, you believe in going to California is what you believe in. You believe that you... <laughs> That, that if you do well out here in the East, you are going to be able to buy yourself a place in Santa Barbara or San Luis Obispo in this paradise where the air is always smelling of flowers and where you sit beside your pool under a palm tree in the evening, even in February, and you eat your, your baked salmon with the dill and the lemon and the whole wheat couscous. And your, and your roasted vegetables, green beans and carrots with honey and tofu and, and hard-crusted rolls with, with chunks of brie in them and you drink a dry Chardonnay wine and you are perfectly happy there in your California paradise. But you see, I know that there is winter in California too, except it's invisible, which, <laughs> which makes it more dangerous, you see. In Minnesota, we have a very visible winter. It, it, it is our common enemy, and it unites us in common purpose, just as communism once did for this country. <laughs> we miss communism, the Soviet Union. We were a better people when we had Soviet Union to, to, to worry about. And now, now who are the enemies of our country? The enemies of our country are elderly women who are getting aboard planes and, and wanting to, to bomb them with shoe bombs, and so they must remove their orthopedic shoes and put them through, uh, through, through an x-ray, and they have to give up their cup of coffee when they get on a plane. And they're just a lot of old women with coffee. They're a threat to our nation. <laughs> so it's all over. It's everywhere you look. It was simpler back in the old days. It 
is Easter vacation. They're just getting back from Easter vacation in the Lake Wobegon schools. We still call it Easter vacation. We don't call it spring break because to call it spring break would seem to imply flowers. <laughs> and you're not going to get that in Minnesota in early April. So we give it the Christian name, Easter, because, you know, the Christian faith is based on hope against evidence to the contrary. So... <laughs> That's good enough for now. <laughs> sort of like real life. But a lot of children have gone south down to Orlando, and they've gone down to Arizona, and so they will have to be retrained to be <laughs> a little more realistic in their expectations when they come back. School has been empty now for the last week and a half, except for the smell of floor wax and polish, the janitor bill, working on the floors, all those little computer screens sitting there empty in the classrooms of Lake Wobegon Elementary, computer screens that tiny children work with an adeptness that astonishes and terrifies their parents. <laughs> the superintendent, Mr. Halverson, sits in his office working, a man who's paid to worry about things, other people think of education as the task of inspiring young people. Mr. Halverson looks on education as an opportunity for people to sue the schools. <laughs> and so he thinks of all the things that somebody could sue the school for. He's worried about floor wax. Maybe they shouldn't be using floor wax. He's worried about computers. How do we know what children are going to be looking up on computers? He's worried about hugging. He's thinking he should put out a memo on this. He's very worried about the lunch lady, Marlene, who wears blouses with rather a lot of cleavage. She's in the grade school. He can imagine a second grader needing help with a tray, and Marlene bends over <laughs> to help the child, and her great appendages come loose of their, <laughs> of their hammock, and suddenly, suddenly we have a case of sexual harassment. He <laughs> thinks about all of these things. He's paid to imagine, anticipate the very worst. Marlene's sister, Darlene, is the waitress at the Chatterbox Cafe, and this last week she met the man she has been talking to on Match.com, <laughs> a man named Orville who lives in Saskatchewan and who has been in love with her online and who online seemed very nice, interested in all sorts of things and with a nice sense of humor. And he adored her as much as you can adore somebody online in a chat room and wanted to come and visit her, drive all the way from Saskatchewan, which was impressive to drive 1,100 miles to meet somebody. And so she said, okay, and he did. And he came this last Tuesday. She took one look at him. He was wearing a green plaid sport coat and driving a pickup truck with all sorts of odd bumper stickers on it. And his enormous eyebrows, actually one eyebrow, which went <laughs> all the way across, she knew she could not love that eyebrow. And he had an enormous belly that was big enough to have a name all of its own. <laughs> but he was in love with her, so she agreed to go out to dinner with him at the Moonlight Bay Supper Club and Resort. And they sat there, and they had the flank steak special, and he had a Rob Roy and then another Rob Roy. And thank goodness he was too shy to ever tell her how deep his feelings were, but he did write her a sonnet which he passed to her. Every time I sit at my computer screen and go into the chat room there online, I hope to meet the beautiful Darlene in this dark world. She is my sunshine. She makes me feel young 
and so alive, meeting her was a stroke of such luck that if she were willing, I would drive down to Lake Wobegon in my pickup truck. And if we click, and I hope that we do, and if she should agree, I could be her man. I would come back with flowers for you and bring you home to be Canadian. <laughs> you are the best I ever met before or since. Let us not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. <laughs> he gave her this sonnet, too shy to tell her how much he loved her. But he was talking about the beauty of Canada and driving across Canada and implying that the two of them could make this trip sometime. She knew that she never would. She could never come to love that eyebrow which looked as if his head had cracked <laughs> and somebody had pasted a big piece of black tape across him <laughs> or that belly that looked as if he'd swallowed a basketball. So she agreed to meet him for breakfast in Little Falls, she baked him some chocolate chip cookies. She put them on a beautiful plate and gave them to him as a going away gift, emphasizing the word going away, <laughs> and said goodbye to him by his pickup truck. He leaned in towards her to kiss her, and she turned her face so he wouldn't make it to her lips. He kissed her on her cheek, and she felt a tear from his eye roll down her cheek, which was hot on her skin, and which has been hot ever since. Her skin is red where that tear rolled down, but nonetheless, she has shifted from Match.com over to Datebook, where she has <laughs> begun chatting with a young man named Virgil who lives out in Pennsylvania and who seems to like her well enough and who is there in the chat room every time she is there as if he were waiting, waiting and hoping for her. It's spring. The song sparrows are singing and the animals are out about to mate in the woods. The raccoons are screaming, fighting over the females. The crocuses are about to bloom any moment, and the snowbirds are calling from Florida, asking us if the snow is all melted and if it is safe to come back. We say, no, the coyotes are running here across the tundra. The snow is still up to the bottom of the living room windows. They're forecasting a blizzard for tonight, winds howling. It's not true, but people love a good story, and that's what we're here for. That's the news from Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average.